gospel reading for today, this time, is in Luke chapter 14, verse 1 and verses 7 through 14. On one occasion, when Jesus was going to the house of a leader of the Pharisees to eat a meal on the Sabbath, they were watching him closely. When he noticed how the guests chose the place, places of honor, he told them a parable. When you are invited by someone to a wedding banquet, do not sit down at the place of honor in case someone more distinguished than you has been invited by your host. And the host who invited both of you may come and say to you, give this person your place, and then in disgrace you would start to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit down at the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. He said also to the one who had invited him, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors in case they may invite you in return and you would be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you. While researching material for my message this morning, I stumbled across a website, realmenrealstyle.com. This webpage had an article titled, 10 Powerful Male Status Symbols, which promised to answer the following burning question. Why are status symbols useful? How can you signal power and authority with your clothing, how can you, big Y or you, be treated like a VIP by simply showing up? Big questions of the day, right? The 10 examples of status to answer those questions are the kind you might expect in any fashion publication. Custom clothing, a great looking watch, quality footwear, the vehicle that you drive, and other things like that. But example number six immediately caught my eye because of how different it was from the other status symbol. This is what it said, quote, strong beliefs and convictions. Now here is in part how it, they explain that. It is a well-known fact that certain powerful people are devout Christians. And as long as you express strong convictions, people who share the same beliefs will be more drawn to you and your courage in expressing them. That makes a powerful status booster. I noticed that there was nothing in this example that they gave, that said anything about actually believing or living out those strong convictions. Rather, when the writer was talking about expressing one's belief for the sake of status, for status, he used the example of athletes who print Bible verses on their jerseys or on the bottom of their shoes. How does that idea make you feel? If you were a Pharisee in the time of Christ, the notion of using public displays of piety for the sake of status would have not only been acceptable, but would have been a way of life in a world where one's station in life was totally dependent on external signs 
and reciprocal action. Last week, if you heard the message from last week, we considered a story from Luke 13 in which Jesus healed a woman on the Sabbath in the synagogue. You remember that? When Jesus was publicly criticized by the leader of the synagogue, Jesus cited both the Sabbath law and the religious leader's hypocritical application of that law. And then he went ahead and healed the woman. The next chapter in Luke, this is Luke 14, opens with these words. On one occasion, when Jesus was on his way, was going to the house of a leader of the Pharisees to eat a meal on the Sabbath day, they were watching him closely. Now here's Luke, once again, focusing on a Sabbath story. But this time, it takes place in the house of a leader of the Pharisees. It might have even been the same leader who had criticized Jesus in the synagogue. It might have been the same Sabbath day. While the setting of the synagogue that we saw in Luke 13 reflected the religious culture of Israel, religious culture, the household setting of the prominent members of Israel society represented the popular culture of that time, which was not just confined to Israel or one religion, but to the powerful and the wealthy and the prominent throughout the Roman Empire, in fact, throughout the known world at that time. This culture, this popular culture, was one of reciprocity and status. Starting with the emperor, who was at the top of the pyramid, and working its way down through the different strata of power and prestige. Social events, such as hosted meals, were strictly used to publicize and reinforce social hierarchy. And that process did not end at the invitation to such a banquet, but how the invitees were positioned and treated once the group had gathered. The closest model that we have to this custom today is the celebratory banquet whether for a wedding, or a corporate event, or a political occasion. Speaking specifically, or thinking specifically, about where you would be placed at a particular table by name. In Jesus' day, an invitation to the meal of a prominent or powerful person was not considered an act of hostility but a gift. And gifts were always, always reciprocated and strings were always attached. If I honored you by feeding you hamburger, you were to honor me by feeding me steak. Especially if I was your superior. If I sat you at a place relatively near to me at a banquet or a meal, you were expected to seek me even closer to you at your banquet. So as you can see, this bartering of hospitality would certainly have excluded those who, as we might say, have no place at the table. No. New York Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm, one of the first African American women to break through the congressional and gender barriers of the 1970s, once told a group of her peers, if they don't give you a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. 
There were no folding chairs at the Sabbath meal to which Jesus was invited. But as Luke shows us, Christ once again turned the tables on those who were, quote unquote, watching him closely. Now Luke doesn't tell us why they were watching him closely. But whatever the reason, once they arrived at the host house, Luke tells us that Jesus began to watch them closely. To observe them. To measure them. Not for the purpose of entrapment or judgment, but to teach them and to teach us a lesson. A lesson about the kingdom of heaven. Jesus told them a parable. When you are invited by someone to a wedding banquet, do not sit down at the place of honor in case someone more distinguished than you has been invited by your host and the host who invited both of you may come and say to you, give this person your place and you will be shamed. But go and sit down at the lowest place so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored. Sharing his observation of the jostling for seats at the host table, Jesus provided the kind of strategic advice that the privilege of the culture would have immediately understood. Jesus couched this advice in terms of shame and honor, concepts that were at the heart of the political and religious and social culture of their world, as it still is in many places today. Everything that these people said or did in their lives was either to gain more public honor or to avoid public shame. And anything one did to gain public honor and status was acceptable, even encouraged from bribery to patronage to fraud. And anything one did to avoid public shame was acceptable from perjury to bigotry and even to taking one own life. Such is what Jesus did. Judas's act was possibly an act of honor on his part, out of his shame for what he did to Christ. We don't consider that, do we? But it's a real possibility. That's why Jesus' words in saying this would have been heard as a technical way, a technical way, to gain honor within a group based upon a false humility. Sit at, here's a technical way, here's a strategy. Sit at the lower seat and allow the host to publicly move you to a higher seat. Now those kind of ideas were embraced as wisdom, as good advice among elite and exclusive groups such as the Pharisee and in public gatherings and private banquets, such as the one we see here. But a banquet strategy was not the reason for Jesus' example. Jesus transformed his parable from the cultural to the spiritual. And he did this at the very end of the parable when he says these words. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled. All who exalt themselves will be humbled. And those who humble themselves will be exalted. Notice, Jesus did not say all Pharisees, all men, all Jews, all wealthy, or even all banquet guests. He simply said all. Then Jesus asserted that all included those who, 
For the Pharisees and the banquet guests were not only excluded, but never even thought of, even thought of, as having a place at anyone's table. No table was ever set for them. No banquet was ever given for them. When you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors in case they may invite you in return and you would be repaid. That's the whole basis of their culture. It's the fulcrum upon which their whole existence exists, their public existence. But when you give a banquet, Invite the poor, crippled, the lame, and the blind. From Jesus' words, we can draw two immediate conclusions. Those at the banquet, with the exception of Jesus, were either friends or brother Pharisees or relatives or rich neighbors. That's the first conclusion. And those who were not at the banquet that Sabbath, but perhaps locked outside the gates of the host's house while waiting for Jesus to emerge, which certainly happened, were the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. And it's also possible, knowing Jesus, that he brought them in with him. They were right there. That would have been a shocker, wouldn't it? Now, why did Jesus use this very specific group of physically and materially disabled people for his example? Why? It was because in the religion of the Pharisees, this group had been specifically punished by God, according to them, with their infirmities and their poverty for their sins or for the sins of some distant ancestor that they didn't even know. Such people were literally untouchable to the elite in Christ's culture. At the home of Christ's host, as well as at the home of the other guests, at their homes, charity only extended as far as their gates and their doors. We're going to hear about a little later next month when we do the story of Lazarus at the gates, a very explicit example of that idea, that, that, that truth that exists. The idea of inviting such a pitiful group of suffering individuals to a household banquet would have been laughable, laughable to those who sat around the table on that Sabbath. I mean, what gain, what gain could the host or any of them obtain from those who had nothing show for their lives except God's disfavor and had absolutely nothing to give back in return for the bank. Jesus' answer to that question was shocking. They were to invite such people to their banquet for the very reason that such people could not repay the favor. Such an act was not a custom for the life of those to whom Jesus spoke. But Jesus made it clear that it was the very essence of receiving the true blessing of God. It was a vision. A vision made real of life in the kingdom of heaven. And you will be blessed, Jesus said, because they cannot repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. You will be blessed. Jesus couches those words 
in the form of a beatitude. But we must not think, and it's wrong for us to think, that he's talking about some kind of divine quid pro quo. Rather, what Jesus was expressing to them was the kind of life he and his disciples were living in real time at that moment. The disciples who shared with Jesus the healing of the sick, the untouchables, the lepers, those who were totally excluded from the culture, feeding the hungry, welcoming the estranged, blessing children, breaking bread with slaves and servants, Gentiles, and other outcasts of their world. And you can see, even with their struggle, how amazed the disciples were as they themselves interacted with people they would have never thought about inviting to a meal or to a party or to a celebration. And yet, together, feasting with Christ, sharing the miracle of the loaves and the fishes, that joy, experiencing the kingdom of heaven in real time, that's what he was talking about. He was saying to them, you cannot have this experience unless you are willing to open your hearts and your gates and let them in and feed them without any expectation of return and welcome them. The love of God is not out there. It's in here. Where you are. That's what Jesus was telling you. And the fact that this kind of life is still the essence of what it means, whether we do it well or not, to be in the community of faith proves Jesus' words because it is a way of living that has outlived thousands of years of countless other customs and traditions. Theologian Rachel Held Evans, one of my favorite writers, who had an untimely death at the age, I think she's about 36, 37, but an incredible theologian, an incredible theologian, described the community of faith, Christ Church, as the most true, wonderful, and eternal banquet for all who wish to share its table. This is what she wrote. For Jesus, a meal is sacramental. It is sacramental when the rich and the poor, the powerful and the marginalized, sinners and saints share equal status around the table. A local church is sacramental when it is a place where the last are first and the first are last and where those who hunger and thirst are fed. And the church universal is sacramental when it knows no geographic boundaries, no political parties, no single language or culture, and when it advances not through power and might, but through acts of love, joy, and peace, through missions of mercy and kindness and humility. We might say, she goes on to write, we might say the kingdom is where strangers come together and remember Jesus when they eat. The kingdom is where addicts and academics, single moms and suburban housewives come together to tell each other the truth. The kingdom is where women heal from abuse by helping to heal others. The kingdom is where you are loved just for showing up. And even still, the kingdom remains a mystery. Just beyond our grasp, all we have are imperfect people in an imperfect world doing their best to produce outward signs of inward grace and stumbling all along the way. This is how she 
All we have is this church. This lousy, messed up, glorious church. Which, by God's grace, is enough. Amen to that. Trinity is God's house, not ours. God is our host. And in this house, Christ has a question for each of us who asks all of us this morning, when is the banquet? When is the banquet? And are we going to be there for it? Are we going to be there eager and ready to serve all the wonderful things that sit on God's table. Food, drink, shelter, hope, healing, compassion, honesty, friendship, and love. Are we only going to wear Christ's words as fashion? Or are we going to write Christ's words in our hearts and live them with humility and faith. Someone in our lives is asking each of us this morning, when is the banquet? Because I need it. I'm hungry. I'm lonely. I'm afraid. I hurt. When is the banquet? Can we host them?